You're sitting in the back room of a theater, dressed in heavy black robes, your luscious red hair contained by a thick hood, nibbing on an iced coffee. Behind you, an imbos positioned next to the door, with a professional expression, trying his damnness to not as much as look at you. The silence in the room occasionally interrupted by the sounds of your drinking. You had awoken early today. It wasn't often that you were called for a job. There was a certain anxiousness that you felt. Mistakes, blunders, screwing up. The theatrics always made you feel terrible for weeks. Though it had been a while since the last time you did that. Nonchalantly, you began expecting your right wrist. As if the little hidden claw beneath your skin had vanished since the last time you checked. Pressing on a barely visible skin pouch, the black stinger shot out of your skin. It was a shiny obsidian black. A tiny, almost unnoticeable hole at its furthest tip. You had tried stabbing yourself with it once, though it seemed like you were immune to your own power. It just really hurt. Five more minutes, Miss Blackwall, said the imp after checking his watch. You attracted the stinger by fully straightening your hand. It was good that you purposefully needed to touch the little skin pouch, otherwise this thing could have been quite inconvenient when it came to personal contacts, as well as sleeping. You leaned back in your chair, sighing loudly. When had it been again? Two days ago? Four? Perhaps a week. That was your minimum requirement for your recruitment contracts, though you had trouble keeping up with dates. You lived at the top floor of an amazing apartment tower, right in the middle of the gang territory of Carmilla Carmine, though you didn't have any preferences when it came to the overlords. After all, you needed to remain neutral, part of the job. Carmilla just had more classy accommodations than most, and she always was a little more generous when it came to jobs. Really, sometimes you saw yourself as her third daughter with how well she treated you. Of course, you never say that out loud or to her face. She'd slit your tongue. You had lazily been drifting in and out of sleep when the call came. You had been lying on an inflatable mattress inside your pool. For the great luxury you experienced in hell, you were expected to jump onto any job. That's why you were here. The five minutes were over, and the imp opened the door allowing you passage. Like the image of death itself, you made your way through a dim yet lavishly decorated hallway, covered in posters of plays and movies you had never seen, most of them hell productions, though some of them, such as Casablanca, came from Earth. After taking your final breath, you stepped onto the stage. Your first look went over the audience, Only a handful of the most powerful overlords had gathered. Most of them sitting in the front row, aside from two of them. Hmm, let's see. Who's here? There were the V's, all three of them. Rosie, of course. Zessiel never skipped a performance. Two members of the Eldritch family, and far in the back, sitting with a young blonde woman, said... Alistair the Radio Demon? Ah, uh, you haven't seen him in seven years. Ah, uh, good to see an old friend. Well, friend wasn't really the right word. Acquaintance? Finally, your eyes went over the person chained on a singular chair in the middle of the stage, all lights of the theater pointing at them. It was a woman. She had beautiful orange skin blue lips and blonde hair. She was dressed like one of Valentino's girls, with white freckles and green eyes. You remained out of sight of her, while everyone else was staring at you with bated breaths. 
What was happening here? This wasn't a play. No. You approached the chained woman from behind. She shivered and started screaming as she finally noticed you. Gently you slid the back of your hand down her cheek. Patiently, Rosie leaned forward, taking out her theater glasses to exactly see the facial reactions of the bound woman. A loud popping noise rang through the theater as Valentina opened a bottle of alcohol. But everyone was too enamored by what was happening on stage to be bothered by it. This wasn't a play. No. This was an execution. The demoness before you must have committed a grave sin that presumably all overlords gathered here desired this woman's demise, or at least democratically agreed on this being proper punishment. Well, considering Alistair was sitting still in the theater, there was the certain exception that he was just here for sick pleasure and would have agreed to any execution. To stop the woman screaming, you placed her hand on her chin, clapping her jaws shut. You inspected her carefully. She was a very basic demoness, sinner born, no special features aside from her discolored skin and strange looking eyes, looking a little like those of horses. She had two small horns poking out of her forehead. They had signs of being cut. Who was it again who ordered her to be executed? Aya yeah, Vox, right, the TV demon. Just in case your eyes started over to him, he was leaning forward in his chair, his mouth was turned into a vile grin. Eyes not even blinking. Well, better not keep the audience waiting. The tension could be cut with a knife. Besides, this wasn't your first time in this specific place of execution. Normally it was some dingy serial killer-like basement or an interrogation room beneath a nightclub. Each overlord having their own execution place. Vox, the TV demon, was one for theatrics, so perhaps that's why he used this old opera-style theater for it. I'm going to explain what will happen to you. Even though you spoke directly into the ear of your victim, everyone in the theater heard your voice. It was thanks to the microphone attached to the rope given to you by Vox. I don't know why you have been called for execution. Nor do I care. Remain quiet. This will make the process more easy on all of us. Your grip on the woman's chin slowly lessened. While she stopped screaming in fear, she now threw herself against her restraints, but to no avail. The chair was bolted to the floor, her powers, if she had any, suppressed by her shackles. You shook your head. Well, to be fair, you were dead the second they put me on this, you muttered. No point in fighting. So about this. See, sometimes tearing a soul apart is enough for dear makers. Sometimes they want a more permanent solution. You're probably wondering how. Chuckling, you hugged her from behind, placing a chin on her shoulder and smiling. See, we have to be creative down here in H E double L. Physical harm is out of the question, as that only leads to regenerations. The same thing goes with poison. Eventually, it's out of the system. Smirking, you kissed her neck. Her skin tasted pleasant, was quite warm. Such a shame. For a moment, you forgot you were in the theater. Sharing an intimate moment with the woman you are about to kill. But there are other means. Addiction is a really popular one. Sometimes forced. Practically always forced if we use it as an execution method. Uh, Zestiel's adopted daughter can make you want to self-delete over and over again whenever you regenerate. Though technically you can recover from that. And if you can suppress it enough, you can live... A miserable life, after decades, maybe. 
And then there's memory removal. It's one that Carmilla really likes to use, but... Your hands move down to the woman's curvy body. My niece worries. You let go of her, walking around her, until you're face to face with her. You're pressed into the skin pouch, your stinger shooting out. It glistened in the stage lights. See, memory removal still technically allows the gaining of new memories. Of a new self. New person. Sure, the demon might be reduced to a newborn intelligence and knowledge-wise, but you can come back from that eventually. And in very rare cases, the memories just suddenly return. That is a possibility. Even though memory parasites devour the memories whole, it just happens. You went down on one knee, placing both hands on her thighs, making sure to scrape her skin with the stinger as you did. What I do, you can never come back from. You said in a serious tone while staying right into her eyes. And then you smiled up at her. Tell me, sweetie. What is your best personality trait? Uh, what? She hushed. To her, this felt more. To her, this felt very out of context, but it was important. I... I suppose I'm quite self-sufficient. Well, at least she taught you an extra personality trait. It was rare that in hell somebody actually told you a personality trait. Ugh. Gently you patted her left knee with your right hand. Good answer. With an evil grin you stood up and walked behind her again. And you gently brushed the back of your fingers against her cheek. Soon this will all be over. But don't worry. I seldom get any complaints. The girl's eyes contracted out of fear. Placing her left onto her head. She froze. Her gaze forward. And finally. You placed the long black stinger against her neck. Her body wiggled out of fear. But there was no way out of this. It pierced her skin. Her body shivering in pain. You pushed forward. Drilling. Shoving. Tearing. Until you felt the resistance of her spine. And then the instants it made contact with her bones, it happened. The woman's body convulsed. She screamed, but it was no longer in pain. Everybody could tell. It was as if the second the needle touched her bones, everything was turned upside down. Every neuron in her body fired. It was the most intense feeling she ever felt. Her eyes rolled back, foam pouring out of her mouth. This feeling was beyond bliss, beyond pleasure. Every millisecond felt like hours of pure ecstasy. From somewhere behind you, the imp from earlier approached. He was holding a bowl, shoving it under the woman's chin. You twisted your stinger, causing even more neurons to fire. She could feel it, her brain melting in the endless drowning river of pleasure. She clenched her teeth, inhaling through them, clenching so hard cracks appeared on them, some of them falling out, falling right next to the ball. As blood began seeping past her lips, she bit off a piece of her tongue, and yet she couldn't stop. She couldn't stop boning, screaming. Her movements became more erratic. And then, from one moment to the next, they ceased entirely. Limp, she sat there. A pink substance, 
beginning to pour out of her eyes like tears. The bowl slowly catching the pink liquid as it slowly dripped out of the woman. Personality excretion, the heretical process of sealing oneself, it was permanent, irreversible, leaving the demon a mere husk. This was the power granted to you by hell. It was an ill mutation of memory parasites who were closest demonic relatives, biologically speaking. The overlords in the theater clapped for you, but... One. The little blonde girl next to Alistair, she was... vomiting into a barf bag. How cute. Reminded you a little of yourself. The first time you did this. Oh well. If Alistair had interest in her, she wouldn't need to get used to this. What a horror show. Oh god. Charlie felt sick to her stomach. She knew demons treated each other terribly, but she never expected this. A true death of the self, leaving only a husk without any desire or want or will or even emotion. A drooling lobotomite. And the screams. They were a complete opposite to what was happening. Charlie was dizzy. Exhaling and inhaling, she watched as Alistair went after you, but she knew he was about to smear sugar on your mouth. Charlie looked around and then got up. A quiet huh! coming out of her throat as vertigo threatened to cause her to lose her lunch. Cautiously, slowly, and with a void expression, she wandered down the aisles, climbing on the stage, and she approached the husk. She snapped her fingers in front of its face, grabbed its hands, hoping to feel any sort of grip, even pinched it. No reaction. It was just breathing, its mouth hung open, it even blinked occasionally. Her expression, a mix of utter bliss and horror, stuck in the last moments before her mind liquefied, and yet... Charlie felt strange about it. Anything that once gave this demon life purpose and meaning was gone now. Why was Charlie start beating so fast? Oh, Charlie admiring her work, hmm? Charlie shook. That was Alistair. He came from the back rooms of the theater. It's horrific. And why is that, darling? Without her personality. Her self. How can she redeem herself in the eyes of God? Alistair took on a mocking, thoughtful pose. Well, I suppose never. But who cares, really? All I know of it is that it was a journalist. And you know the saying, you don't hate journalists enough, you think you do, but you don't. He raised his cane and poked the husk's cheek. Besides, it certainly doesn't care anymore. Charlie grimaced. Stop calling her it. Can't you at least try to see why this is so disturbing to me? Alistair furred his brows. Where is she, that black wall woman? Oh, uh, well, she just left. Alistair pointed to the end of the hallway, where a fire exit was located. Thank you. And so Charlie rushed forward. Meanwhile, Alistair shouted back at her. I'll be going to the hotel then, darling. I'll be there if you need me. You were about to enter your car when Charlie burst out of the door. Since you weren't an overlord, not even allowed to make contracts, you didn't have any powers aside from the ones given to you by your biology as a demon. So you couldn't teleport. 
It was the least dramatic thing in your life. At least your car was thematically appropriate. So it did have some class to it. It was a pimped-up funeral car. Matte black, with silver details and wide rim tires. Even had red neon lights beneath it. And a full red Zantin equipment within. It had just spoken to you when you got your first real paycheck for executing someone. You had replaced the area where coffins were usually put with an expensive sound system. Sure, you never used it, but it was there. And made even Valentino blush. Your eyes met Charlie's as she waved you down. And so, sighing, you stepped out the vehicle reluctantly. Excuse me? Ugh. She was out of breath as she stopped next to you. Uh, hello? Yeah, hi. Uh, I mean, just... Uh, uh, I was just, uh, I have a question. Seeing her weird puppy eyes made you uncomfortable. Uh, I, I, I wanna know, uh, you, you know what you did is wrong. Was wrong, right? You blinked perplexed and confused. You looked around. Was someone recording this? Were you being pranked on? Uh, and who are you? Charlie shook. I, I'm Charlie Morningstar, daughter of Lucifer and owner of the... Daughter of Lucifer! You said impressed. I mean, I deal with overlords, but I never expected to speak with royalty. Charlie blushed. I... It was rare demons acknowledged her technical status as a princess. Mostly due to her attitude, she assumed. So, Charlie, you have a problem with my job. Well, to be fair, I can see why. I work like... What? You pulled out your phone from your robes. Four hours? If we include me sitting in the changing rooms? Occasionally? Every once in a while? I certainly can see why someone would see that as wrong or lazy. No, I, I mean... Jeez, just four hours? You shrugged. Uh, that's besides the point. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't mean how much you work, it's, it's what you do. I mean... She shuffled uncomfortably. You killed her. Like the her that is her, but like you... Keep her soul bound to her body and hell. So? Charlie swipes her hair in thought and then said, What you did made it impossible for her to ever redeem herself. You had no response to that. Your instincts told you to laugh and just drive away, but your brain was just too curious. So you're saying I should just stop my job? I think maybe you should. Let me tell you something, princess. You interrupted her. This is hell. We are all here for a reason. And we are all trying to live with the least amount of pain possible. We chase dopamine to not confront our issues because we are all failures down here. You grabbed her stupid little tie, pulling her close to her face until your nose is touched. If I stop now, you know what they do to me? They wipe my memory if they catch me. And that's if I'm lucky. I'm in too deep. And why in the world would I risk that? I have a comfortable life. I have a powerful job. And I'm banging like five overlords at once. So you're a whore? Your eyes narrowed. Aren't we all sugar tits? You shoved her aside. Now, if you don't mind. Uh, um, I have one more question, Miss Blackwall. <sighs> what now? Charlie shuddered at your gaze. Why did she scream like that? Pardon? Why did she enjoy it? Charlie realized that this was the most disturbing part about it all. It horrified her. The thought of it. How could someone enjoy having their entire being be liquefied and extracted? It's disturbing. You thought for a moment, and then reached for a bag you had already thrown into your car. I mean, I never take my own stuff. 
You said as you threw one of the three syringes you gathered from today's execution at Charlie. She barely managed to catch it in time. The liquid inside felt warm, and she could hear quiet whispers coming from it. What is this? Charlie, of course, knew. She just didn't want it to be confirmed. Her personality liquid. The upper cluster of hell pays huge amounts for just a few drops of it. It's awesome. Charlie held the syringe away from herself and vomited on the ground. You're a monster! Uh-huh. You reached for the syringe, assuming she wasn't going to take it, but the grip around it was tight. Was she going to destroy it? Yeah, that would be a shame. Still, you let go. Stop, I have decided yet. What I do with this? Oh, God. <sighs> I... Would it honor her if we took this stuff? It was weird where this came from. Perhaps. It was just how she felt about the scream she heard. You chuckled internally as you realized that. Look. Your eyes met Charlie's as you put all your effort into the act. Do you think this is easy for me? What do you mean? You crossed your arms, turning around so she didn't see her smile. I used to be a librarian. That wasn't even a lie. I died in 2000 during a gang drive-by. In the crossfire. I was just 20. Oh, jeez, you have been living longer down here than on Earth. That's so sad. Yeah. I have. This wasn't even a lie either, but the fact you chose to say it right now was pure deception. I didn't choose this. You said, pressing the skin pouch, revealing the stinger to her. It looked so much bigger up close. Down here, it's survival of the fittest. You said dramatically. And I'm trying to be the fittest. Oh, you poor thing. Charlie placed a hand on your shoulder comfortingly. What you have there is her. Thank God she still stood behind you. That smile of yours was so evil. It's her. Her entire personality. All of it. While I never take my own dosages of excreted personalities, making a part of yourself by injecting it might make it just a little better. Right. I mean, in a way, she'd continue to live within you. Right? If Vaggy was here, she would have been able to see through you. Especially since she, as an angel, had insight on the color of people's souls. She'd know that it was by now tainted beyond repairs. Your soul, a true dark soul, corrupted through countless sins you amassed in hell since you started getting chummy with the overlords. If you chose redemption, no matter when, it would be a long road, maybe even decades, hundreds of years, probably. So why even bother to begin with, right? I, I, I think so. This was about some drug. It wasn't signing away her soul for some dubious deal. Angel just constantly took stuff like this before he went clean. Though, this still would make her a hypocrite. Then again, if this could help ease her pain about the woman you killed, and if she truly would live within her... Somehow, this made her feel better. What happens when I take it? Like the immediate effects? Your eyes turn pink. Uh, and whatever happens next is up to the personality. Though Valentino described it to me once as every neuron burning with the intensity of a thousand suns, and he always gets super needy while on it, rubbing himself up on everything. It's quite fun, actually. 
Charlie stared at the syringe, and you quickly grabbed it. Hey! If you're going to take it, you would have said so already. And besides, you shouldn't take it alone. You'll hurt yourself. Charlie stomped on the ground, causing a crack. Okay, so she did have fire in her. I have decided I'm going to honor her soul and take that. She pointed at the syringe. Fine then, princess. You walked around the car and opened the passenger door. What are you doing? I know how to deal with people who take it. You smirked. It's quite enjoyable. You should take it while I'm present to make it even better. Uh, right. You just said that. Charlie's heart was pounding. Meanwhile, back at the Haspen Hotel, Alistair was boiling some tea when Vaggy rudely interrupted him. Where's Charlie? She snarled. What? Where's Charlie? She left with you. She isn't here. You are here. The radio demon tilted his head and blinked. Well, she wanted to discuss something with a friend of mine. I know your friends. She growled, pointing a finger at the overlord. Listen, Vaggy, they are a very trusted friend. They are a very diligent worker as well. Accepts any job at any time we give them. He took the kettle off the stove and poured the liquid into a cup. Well, diligence is a virtue. What do they, she put they in quotation marks using her fingers, do for a living? Elisa smirked. They put on shows. Quite classy. Only very few people are invited to them. <laughs> They're indeed nothing like the shows of that spider. I'm sure Charlie is in good care in their hands. Vaggy crossed her arms, thinking, well, she certainly was calmer now. But that's what Alistair said. Besides, don't you trust your girlfriend? No, no, no I, I do. I, I trust her. I'm just worried. About what, darling? Don't call me darling. You know her. I just feel like if someone were to kidnap her or something, she'd be too naive to even realize it. Alistair gave the angel a look. Really now, darling? She's the heiress of hell. I'm certain she's mature enough to not get herself in a bad position. Alistair's grin widened. You're right. I hate to admit that you're right. However, Alistair wasn't right. As in this moment, Charlie's little heart was pounding. She was sitting on a sofa in the middle of your loft. She felt exposed. Uh, you have a nice place. Blackwall? Uh-huh. You are standing in front of your alcohol selection. Um, I don't drink. She gulped. Freudian slip. Much, I mean. I, I don't drink much. Yeah. She added quickly. Right. Something like then. Don't worry, I don't drink a lot either. You smirked. How about a Cosmo, then? Charlie breathed slowly. Uh, sounds lovely. You weren't a bartender. You couldn't shake it. You didn't have a shaker. Nor did you have those super nice ice cubes that were see-through. Still, you had what was needed. You mixed vodka, lime juice, cranberry juice, taking a martini glass, and placed one ice cube in it. In fact, you made two. One for you, one for Charlie. I mostly keep alcohol myself only for the funny colors. I rarely drink it. You admitted as you approached her. But when I have a guest over, I just have to offer a drink. It's good etiquette. Charlie nodded as she took your glass. She zipped and grimaced. 
Well, definitely a lighter drink, and due to your own distaste for alcohol definitely having less vodka than normal in it, it still was quite painful for Charlie's and your own palate. You sighed. It's good, right? Biting a lower lip, Charlie nodded. Yeah. Silently both sat there for a moment. It's disgusting. Yeah, it is. You looked at each other and then chuckled. Charlie blushed. <laughs> uh, so about your loft, she mumbled. Looks quite nice, actually. Uh, I like your pool. You hummed pleased. <laughs> Wanna take a dip? Oh, I couldn't. I, I don't have a swimsuit with me. You looked her in the eyes. I mean, what you have chosen to do with me, it warms up your body a lot. Maybe you should. She frowned. I, I think maybe and... What are you doing? You had stood up and were unraveling the cord around your hip that held your rope together, only for it to unceremoniously fall to the floor. Wait, you have been naked? Well, yeah, I usually perform my job, you know, without anything on, but that's only when the overlords present are all guys. They love it. But since you, Rosie, and Madame Eldritch were present, I refrain from that. Well... Then again, if any Eldridge is present, I refrain from that. They are very stuck up. Without waiting to hear her reaction, you walked over and descended the steps into your pool, slowly waiting inside. The water was cool and quiet. Your pool was actually quite shallow, not enough to truly dive or jump in, and you could practically see it everywhere. Your water going just over your chest when you sat down. Meanwhile, Charlie didn't take any more coercion. She was holding the needle, having shed her own clothes, minutes later. She waited for the water, sitting down next to you, embarrassed and a little envious of the size of your chest. They were definitely bigger than hers, or Vaggie's. So do I just... She held out her left arm with the syringe, somewhat pointing towards a vein. Yeah, if you want your blood to push out most of the juice before you really feel it. She looked at you confused. That's not good. Oh, okay. She then looked down at herself. Is it like an insulin shot? Do I, do I ram it in my stomach? Better, but you're in water now. Right? You smirked. Want my help, Charlie? I did this a lot with Val. She nodded, and then blushed as you took the syringe off of her. You waited around Charlie until you were face to face. Tenderly, you wrapped your arms around her, placing your chin on her shoulder. <gasps> what are you doing? She asked breathlessly. Your body, it felt so hot, so soft. Humming. You placed the tip of the syringe between her shoulder blades. And she gasped. Thinking about how you shoved the stinger into the woman's spine earlier. <laughs> That's my... This is the preferred place. Goes straight to your brain and doesn't create a mess. Gently you brushed over her back. A little of salvia dripped from Charlie's mouth as she felt your body press against her. And then, right here, he whispered softly into her ear, and Charlie braced herself. And then came the pain. The syringe penetrated her thin skin, the needle moving past the bone right into the epidural space. It's an upper spine injection. It helps relax muscles, allowing the liquid to reach the brain quicker and... You were interrupted by Charlie's hands as they were placed on your hips, digging into your flesh. <laughs> Work almost instantly. As you leaned back, throwing the syringe somewhere behind you outside the pool, you looked at Charlie. Her eyes glowing a vibrant pink. A little bit of spittle ran down her chin. Right now, every neuron in her body was firing, albeit slightly less than the husk did earlier. 
it was still an intense feeling of pleasure. Like her entire body had become an erogenous zone, and her being in the water just meant that there more was and her being in the water just meant that there was more pressure all around her body. <laughs> she brabbled something. What's wrong? Speak to me, Charlie. <laughs> her hands were moving on their own, but just as they reached the right spot, you grabbed her wrist harshly. The little bit of pupil that was visible in her pink eyes stared back at you. Let me do that feels better that way. She bit her lips so hard a thin line of blood came from her mouth. Sensations of pain and pleasure making her eyes roll back. Meanwhile, you lean forward, reaching with one hand beneath the water and pressing your lips on hers. Her tongue moved erratically in your mouth, trying to receive as much pleasure as possible. <laughs> Looks like even the goodest girls of hell will turn bad. Looks like even the goodest of girls will turn bad in the bowels of hell. Thank you for watching my video until the very end. And I would like to remind you to please like and subscribe and comment something down below. I read every comment you write to me and I try to re reply to them as often as I can. But before we say goodbye, I would like to shout out all of my lovely darling stewards who so graciously support my third tier membership. Husky HD 17, Hopeful, Castella Misery, Bree, Zoe, Ikea, Mystic Jade 111, Annabelle R. Contreras, Giovanni Moriarty, Twilight Mia, Angry Boxman, Hella, Bitbit, Melofia, Anonymous Weep, and Nicodemus D. Thank you so much for your continued support. And finally, I'd like to thank all of my lovely darling mates for also supporting me financially. I couldn't do this without you. Thank you very much for watching my video. I hope you enjoyed it. Have a nice day. And please remember to like and subscribe.